Good morning. Hello, Aloyd family. I'm so glad to be here with Pastor Buster. How are you? Great. How are you doing, Ruben? I'm doing better. Now <laughs> I can step. Uh, I can I can put some some weight on my right foot. So for those of you who don't know, I just found out a few minutes ago he ruptures Achilles. Yeah. Like what's up with the King Pastors rupturing Achilles? You guys stop it. <laughs> I, I, I'm done with the boot. I'm done with the walker. So I'm ready for give it to the next pastor. That's oh, we, oh who's say. next? One, and two, three, not it. Not All right, it? There okay. we go. There we go. go. All right. Well, welcome, guys. We, you know that we are starting, well, we're actually in week five of this, no, week four of this series of Steps to Christ. We're reading this wonderful book from Ellen White, and the title for today is Consecration. Last week, uh, Pastor Michael and, uh, I need to be reminded, who did it with? Jared. Jared, Jared. yes. Uh, Pastor Michael and Jared had a conversation on two chapters, actually chapter three, that was the longest chapter of the book in chapter 4. So repentance and confession. And now we're talking about consecration. Uh, you know, uh, I actually had a, probably an hour-long meeting with Reuben. We both read through the chapter uh, separately. And then we came together. And we just had an amazing discussion on Thursday. And I want to continue that conversation. There's an aspect of it that I didn't see that he helped me see in a uh, meeting in the middle. And I, that's what I want, we want to encourage the audience to do as well. Don't just sit here and listen to us. But... Go home around your tables today and have com uh, conversations about what it means, uh, what does consecration mean? What is Ellen White trying to get after in this chapter? And it is a good time to make a disclaimer. This book, Steps to Christ, is not like a logical, like, step by step. Like, once you got repentance, check. Confession, check. And now <laughs> consecration, check. Sometimes our mindsets are like to-do list, right? But right. this chapter of consecration is uh, really emphasizing one aspect. It's not necessarily the step after repentance or yeah. after confession. It's just one aspect, which we're going to talk about in, in later chapters, like following chapters, that are emphasizing the, the work of, of the day by day, right? Right. Uh, and I think we, you and I came up with this. If the overall goal is this, is for us to get to know the Savior for ourselves, for us to develop this relationship with Him. The steps are aspects or layers of a relationship with Christ. Where does that relationship begin? Maybe it begins with a repentance. Maybe it begins with consecration. I have no idea where it begins for you, but I know where it begins for me. And none of us can, uh, Reuben or I, we can't develop that relationship for you. That's for you to find for yourself in an open and, and loving relationship with the Savior for yourself. And we know that we're in different walks of life. <laughs> uh, in that process, we know that for some people, it may look different. Even the same stage will look yes. different. So your job as a Christian, as a follower of God, is not for you to compare yourself with other people. It's not for you to compare yourself even with your past version of yourself. Yeah. Sometimes, like th three days before I ruptured my Achilles, I was running a 12-mile long run, like nothing. And days later, like I was not able even to, to step on my right foot. So I understand that there's some frustrations. There but we go. Ellen White talks about the spiritual process that you get to experience today. So today, your journey is not for you to compare to other people. So we're going to start with the first verse, which Let's is in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13. And it says, and you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. Ouch. I, I, I say ouch because that's amazing and everything else. But how many of us have ever come to church and searched half-heartedly? I, if, I, if, I, if I'm honest with myself, there's many days where I'm half-heartedly having a devotional, half-heartedly praying. And I think the, the target there, the, the key component is, we search for me with all of your heart. So, Ruben, what does it mean to search with all your heart? Well, it means to surrender, to yield. That the, key, the key word mm. that she uses along the chapter is yield. You need to surrender. And then that need to is like a little caution word. Like I'm, I'm real, a little triggered by this word need to because sometimes <laughs> it feels like uh, in order to use that word, there needs to be an external change. And I'll be honest, sometimes most, the, most, the biggest changes in your life start not from the exterior but from the interior. Mm. And, and not most. I feel that all of them. Right. And when Holy Spirit is working in your heart, that surrender is going to be your assurance it's going to give you peace knowing that you're giving your all to God. Right. You know, I, I love that aspect that you just shared, which is yielding, because a lot of times, and she talks about this several times in the chapter, we try to muscle it. We try to muscle our religion, our spirituality, and say, man, if I just give up this and I just do that, then, then I, I will get it right. And 
I will ask this question. How's it been working out for you? <laughs> yeah. Because I know for myself, yeah. whenever I try to do it, it yeah. doesn't work. But the more I yield, the more I open up and let him in and stop hiding and saying, God, you can have all of me except for this. Yeah. To let him have all of it, yeah. the better life is. It and really that's, is. That's what the first uh, quote says, right? The first right. quote in 43, uh, uh, paragraph 2. The whole heart must be yielded to God. Or change can be never wrought in us by which we are to be restored to his likeness. Ah, well, that goes directly with Jeremiah 29, 13. Yes, yes. Uh, for this change, to, and listen here, I love change and I hate change at the same time. But for those who want to be conformed into the image of Christ, those of us who want to experience transformation, that means change has to come about. So we have to embrace change. But the Christ-led change that he is trying to fill us with, with his Holy Spirit. And so that only happens when we yield to God, once again, that word comes up, yield. Yeah, yield, yield is a common word in this chapter. And I like how she's framing it not in the performance way. She's really clear later on that your performance is not what makes you to be this valuable person. Your, your value comes for who God says that you are. And when you embrace that yeah. moment by moment, that reality becomes your experience. And that is your yielding. So yeah. even in the fact of you yielding, there was already a prevenient grace. There was already a grace of God motivating you into right. that, making that decision. Even the aspect of considering to make this decision, it's already uh, uh, the work of Holy Spirit in your heart. And, and by the way, this is, ties directly to what Reuben was saying earlier. This is where comparing gets us into trouble. Because I can say, man, I'm yielded more than so-and-so, mm -hmm. or I'm not yielded as much as so-and-so, and those become our benchmarks, but our benchmark is Christ. Our benchmark is what we were yesterday. Our benchmark is, is looking solely at the, the, at the eyes of Christ, looking at the heart of Christ, and watching the things of this world become strangely dim, the light and the glory of his grace, right? Yes. So as I'm looking and focusing in on Christ, he brings about that change because I'm willing to yield. There's another uh, quote that it's in 43.3, uh, like the paragraph 3. I don't know if it's there in the screen, but it says, The warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. The yielding of self, surrendering all to the will of God, requires a struggle. But the soul must submit to God before it can be renewed in holiness. So... Yeah, so it's, it's the, the struggle is real, I think, as the kids on the street say, right? Uh, there is a struggle, and the struggle does come about. Listen here, none of us uh, want, I will say this, uh, Ruben, you've been married for how long now? Eight years, right? Eight, Am I right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. He's looking at her. Good, good job. Wait, way test. to go. All right. I, I, test. I will go. not ask him his anniversary date. I don't want to give him in trouble here. I, I do here. know that. I all right. Do know. All right. I'm not on math, so I cannot count. All right. What, what day is it? Uh, May, 17, <laughs> May 17. May 17, 2015. May 17, 2015. We're good. We're but good. that first year of marriage is difficult because I was used to having my own space, right? I had a roommate in college. It's not the same. You stay to your side. I stay to my side. You get married and... You know, my, listen here, I have more beauty products than my wife does. <laughs> Stop laughing. It's not funny, all right? This skin does not keep itself, all right? So, uh, but she was so surprised at that. She's like, why do you need all this stuff and you're not using half of it? I'm like, because I have to test it out and see if it works, right? And so she's getting mad because my side of the room is not as clean and tidy as she'd like it to be. Mm. And I'm mad because she's getting after me, all these things. And then I realized that this really is a compromise. Like, yes. I have to, we have to yield to one another. And which is why I'm so glad that I married the wife that I've married. It's now been uh, 17 years for us, 16 years for us. Sorry. Okay, okay. so you, you, you already are kind of like, yeah, yeah okay. there we go. You know, okay, good. But in this relationship with God, it's compromise as well. It is yielding. It is saying, God, I want to give up myself, but I don't want to give up myself. Help me to want to give up myself so I can follow you. Yeah, and I want to propose like a new or a different approach to that word struggle. I feel that when we say struggle, usually it comes with some negative connotation, right? I'm struggling with my homework. I'm struggling with my assignment. I'm struggling with my, with my marriage. And when I was running, I was back in my journey of running. I was preparing for a marathon. I was getting these guided runs from uh, Coach Bennett, which is from the Nike Plus uh, uh, Club. Like, it's, it's free. It's a free app. You can download it and get guided runs. Okay. Nothing special about right, that. Right. <laughs> so, but what was special is that in one of those guided runs, he says, like, okay, if you're struggling in the middle of your race, that's a good thing. Because I want to tell you something. I want to tell you that struggle means 
successfully not giving up. Oh. Struggle means that you are still in the battle, but you haven't lost the battle. You haven't given up. The moment that you stop fighting, the moment that you stop struggling, that battle's over. The moment you stop moving forward. The moment that you stop moving forward. The moment that you like stop. give up in your in your addictions, in your in your difficult times, in the challenges that may come in different angles. That moment you're no longer struggling. That is game over. Oh, I love it. So that. let's let's think of a struggle not as a necessarily a bad thing, but an opportunity for us to keep on this battle. And after the struggle, we know in this process, in this consecration experience, we know that we'll come up better persons, God willing. So, in other words, struggle or resistance actually builds vigorous, uh, vigorous activity of actually becoming stronger. And, and it sounds, sounds good when you're out of the struggle telling, hey, struggle is successfully not giving up. And you say, cool, cool, thanks. But how can you make this pain disappear? Like, let, let's be honest. Like, when you're in the middle of the struggle, at least uh, uh, of, I mean, you don't think about how, how good life is, right? That's right. not how the struggle usually pushes you towards. Yeah. But if we position ourselves into re realizing that, okay, this is not my end. This is not the end of my life. At least we can see that in the middle of the pain and the middle of the struggle, there can be purpose. Uh, I, I love this. And uh, we have some verses up here that go right along with this. Romans 7, 23 and Romans 8, verse 1. Uh, Romans 7, for those who don't know, this is the, the chapter where Paul talks about struggling with sin, that which I do, I don't want to do, right? But here, verse 23, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. And so you might think like, oh, we give up there. But, but listen to this. It accumulates at 8, verse 1, chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation in tho to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. In other words, struggle is always going to be with us, but so is Christ. Keep your eyes focused in on Christ, and you will win the war and not just the struggle. Yeah, and, and the beauty of it is that your performance is not what is going to win the war. Here it says that condemnation is not coming to you because of Jesus Christ. Amen. So thankfully, it's not about what I can bring to the table. Yeah. And, and thankfully, I know that this is gospel. This is good news. This is for me, right? Um, there's this uh, verse or there's this uh, saying that we usually hear. It's like, if it's too good to be true, how do you finish it? If it's too good to be true? It's not that true. It, it's Probably not true. true. Like, if it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true, right? We say, like, if it's too good to be true, like, we better not believe it, right? I'm in Facebook Marketplace trying to buy a bike, and you say, like, oh, it's too good to be true. It's like 50 bucks for, like, a $10,000 bike. No, that's too good to be true. Yeah. The gospel is too good to too good and it's true. Amen. So the gospel is too good and it's true. It's not like, like news that you say, okay, it's too good, but uh, maybe that's not for me. No, this is gospel. This is good news. It's too good and it's true. Right. There's no condemnation for you in Jesus Christ. I, I love that. And uh, too good to be true. I have, I've gotten over my addiction to infomercials. Anybody else with me? Amen. Because those <laughs> things are too good to be true. But Jesus Christ is good. He's great. He's the greatest. And he is true. Yes. yes. Uh, which brings us to our next section. Uh, we, we, we entitled this Rational Decision slash Satan's Deception. And it's uh, chapter or, or page 43, paragraph 4. The government of God is not as Satan would make it appear. Founded upon a blind submission and unreasoning control, it appeals to the intellect and the conscience. Come now and let us reason together. It's the creator's invitation to, to the beings he has made. Yeah, and uh, the verse that she's quoting, it's Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, that says, Come on, now let's settle this, says the Lord. Through, thou your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Thou they are red like crimson, I will make them white as wool. You know, uh, this morning I, I went on a, a, a walk around the neighborhood and I put on the audio book of this chapter. And you can get through it. I challenge you to do the same. Uh, I found one on YouTube. Just listen to it. And this part really hit me because how can you have a relationship with someone that you don't believe is real? How can mm. you have a relationship with someone that you believe doesn't communicate back with you? The relationship that we have with God is not one way. It's not us begging him and then him arbitrarily just saying, oh, there it goes. I'll make it happen. But you can't see me. Yeah. You can't talk to me. No. Yeah. 
This is a real relationship where God speaks to us. And this appeal to come and let us reason together is God saying, I want to come into your life. I have something to tell you. I have something to show you. I have something for you to experience. And it's with me. This is not something that's fake. This is something that is real. And so come and reason with God. Uh, It's tangible. It's real. And that word, reason together, that is translated in NLT like, let's settle this. Right. There's this language of uh, business, mm. of transaction. But in this transaction, what you're given is your sins. <laughs> what you're given is your heart. Yeah. Like, literally has no value. If anything, is negative value. And God says, okay, I'm, I'm, you, you give me your heart, you give me your sins, and I'm going to cleanse them. I'm going yeah. to uh, totally purify them. So that's... A really bad deal if you yeah. look at it in like a perspective of like uh, transactions. Hey, hey, Ruben, this Friday I'm going to come to your house and I want you to give me all your trash yes. you can find. Yes. I'm going to give you a thousand bucks. That's what Anybody else up for that deal? Right? Like, listen here, our sins are like trash. They're, they're, they're nothing. They do nothing for us. And God is saying, I want those because what I'm going to give you back in, in, uh, in return is, is eternal and it is great and it is something that I want to give you freely. And, and the beauty of this is that, once again, it's not about what you do or what you stop doing. When, and now we're shifting towards, like, the part of how does consecration look like in right. my day by day. We talked about consecration. We know it's uh, uh, yield. We know it's surrender. We know uh, it's, it's too good and it's true. And now how does it look in a day-by-day experience? There's a, uh, well, this is one of my favorite Bible verses, John 13. Uh, 35. I love it as well. It's beautiful verse, uh, words uh, spoken by Jesus. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Ah. If, if, if a group of people who had no idea about the King Seventh Day Adventist Church came in here and they were tasked by the FBI to investigate, are these people disciples? And we would say, I return tithe and offerings, I come to church every week, I sit, I, I, I'm in Elevate, I sing, I do all these different things, and, and, they're, and, they're, and according to this, they're saying, well, do they have love for one another? Well, they don't really even know each other's names, right? I, listen, I don't, I don't know you, I'm not trying to step on your toes, like, oh, they, they sit separately except for with just their friends and families, so are you truly his disciples? Do you truly have love for one another? What would they find in your life? In uh, page 44, paragraph 2, it says, There are those who profess to serve God who rely upon their own efforts to obey his law, to form a right character, and to secure salvation. Their hearts are not moved by any deep sense of the love of Christ, but they seek to perform the duties of a Christian life as that which God requires of them in order to gain heaven. Such religion is worth nothing. In order to gain heaven, that kind of rings, uh, it brings me to like the experience of the rich young ruler. <laughs> Master, what good thing should I do in order to inherit heaven? And that's the approach of many of us at some point had when we didn't get the good news. And we say like, what do I need to do? What do I need to do in order to gain heaven? And we how start, can I earn it? Yes, how can I earn it? How can I do a, a show behavior so I check this? And then she, she, she talks a little bit about, like, the, that experience. That religion is worth nothing. Nothing. You know, Desire of Ages uh, talks about the rich young ruler, and she said that the world, he walked away because the world was to forever receive his worship. And where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, right? And so where is your heart? Where is your treasure? Where is your focus? If your focus is on getting heaven, your focus is the wrong thing. Uh, heaven, actually, eternal life begins, according to John chapter 17, uh, verse 3, begins when we know the Father and Jesus Christ whom we sent. It begins when we have the relationship. Heaven has already begun to those who have accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. So remember, your own efforts to obey God's law are not going to bring you closer to heaven. With this, like, what I'm not saying is, don't obey the law of God, or that's not necessary in your experience to, 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 to gain salvation. And we're going to go and explain a little bit more how does this come to life in my day-by-day, in my experience, which is in, paragraph, in verse um, 
page 44, paragraph 2, that says, the love of Christ will be the spring of action. Mm. Listen to this. Love to Christ will be the spring of action. Those who feel the constraining love of God do not ask how little may be given to meet the requirements of God. They do not ask for the lowest standard, but aim to perfect conformity to the will of their Redeemer. Mm. So in this process, your life is not to aim to the lowest GPA in order to pass the class. Your life is not about like running away from sin is what you need to do. You're not running away from sin. You're running towards your Father. Amen. You know, I, I have to finish that because that last line hits me. With earnest desire, they yield all and manifest an interest proportionate to the value of the object which they seek. Listen to this. A profession of Christ without this deep love is mere talk. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm so tired of mere talk uh, because there's so many who say, oh, I want to follow Christ, and then they try to muscle it like we talked about earlier. They try to earn it, but... Until you experience Christ for yourself, and I think that's where we are right now in this day and age, there's a lot of people who talk about Christianity, but not a lot of people who actually walk with God. And that's what he wants. He wants us to actually have a relationship with him. This is, this is why consecration is not a behavior work. It's not, so, it's not for you to change your actions, to, to do something or to stop doing something. Uh, consecration, if you can summarize it in one word, it's an experience. Mm. It's something that shows on the outside, yes, but because that work on Holy Spirit working on your inside is showing you, is showing so. Right. It's that, it's, for me, I'm, I'm in this process of uh, getting into recovery, so I'll be able to, to jump and run and swing and do all the other activities. But today, what I can do, what I can give is going to physical therapy and working with my little exercises and moving <laughs> my feet like really slowly or doing so basic things like holding a bowl and throwing it. So I, I work on my balance. So that is my experience today. Right. That is my experience today. Like I kind of like compare myself to back then when I was running 12 plus miles and say like, oh, I suck today. Yeah. Like it, it is not for you to compare to your past. It's like today you get to experience this life. In the situations that you are currently in, in the, in the, in the struggles that you are living. In, 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 in that process, you see that perfect conformity, that word perfect is a little, a little <laughs> weird for us. Perfect conformity is like you're fully yourself giving your all, whole all of your life, all of your life to God. That is perfect conformity. It, it, it's not about like perfect in, your, in, the, in the perfect situations. It's not like perfect without struggles. It's just your Aiming to perfect conformity, you're giving yourself fully to your Redeemer. I love that. And I think that brings us to one of our last quotes. It's this page uh, 47, paragraph 1, which is an appeal to the will, appeal to the will of man. The power of choice God has given to men, it is theirs to exercise. You, you cannot change your heart. You cannot, uh, of yourself, give to God its affections. But you can choose to serve him. You can give him your will he will then work in you to, to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Uh, man, that we can choose to serve. We can choose Christ. We can choose to have a relationship. We can choose to make the time to do so. Yes. Um, at the end of this chapter, she's making an appeal, which is an invitation to have this consecration experience. And, and she tries to deal with different kinds of objections that may come up in, in, a, in a human heart. She says, like, well, you feel it is a big ask for you to consecrate your whole being because you're young or because you, you have a, a good life and you need to uh, enjoy your life. She says, there's no real joy that comes outside the will of God for you. Like, it, there's a lot of fake joy. There's a lot of temporary ethereal uh, joy that can be, like, uh, working for you for a few seconds, for a few days. But it's not eternal your father your heavenly father it's working for you to have joy and for you to have satisfaction not only today not only for the next month but forever amen and, and, and working according to his will living our wills yielding to him involves knowing what we're created for like knowing that we have purpose and according to our God, he, he, he has our owner's manual. He knows, like, what is best for us. As, if we're working according to that reality, we realize that it's not God being unfair. It's not God being arbitrary. It's not God trying to, to restrict you things. And it's not about you trying to measure, to, to measure up. It's, being, it's about, like, God's providence. 
So you feel it's a big ask, and she says, look at Jesus. Amen. You feel that you, you don't need it. You feel that you're good on your own. Look at Jesus. And she says, like, you, 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 you don't know how to do it. Look at Jesus. So in every moment of your experience, when you feel that you are struggling, successfully not giving up, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus, the author and finisher of, of your faith. faith. The beginning at the end of your faith is Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, I, I, I want to end with this, uh, and Ruben has a little bit more to say, but, but if you haven't started on this relationship with things, I'm glad you're here at church, but church is not the tell-all, be-all. The tell-all, be-all is a relationship with Christ. If you haven't started with a devotional life, with opening up your word, actually talking with God, actually listening, start today. Uh, I have some engaged questions uh, Ruben and I came up with that's going to be on a, uh, have a, start having that conversation with uh, your friends and family members around a table uh, later today. But then if you're, if you're studying zero minutes a day, start with one minute. If you're studying 10 minutes a day, go to 20. But actually have this real vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ and may it begin today and last forever. And I encourage you to have people that you can be open and honest enough to answer these questions in a, in a real fashion. Like right. Have a re real talk. Uh, open yourself, be vulnerable, and, and find people that you can trust and say, hey, let's, let's look over these questions. Let's, let's, let's talk. Let's be honest. Let's be there for each other. With your mouth full of haystack, answer question two, right? It's okay, right? It's good. <laughs> yeah, well, we are so glad that you were able to, to be here online and in person in this uh, Chapter 5 uh, study. And we know that it's a, a, beautiful, uh, a beautiful day that God gives us. And today, as we are in this journey of consecration, of giving our hearts to God, we know that we are complete today in our journey today, perfect today. And tomorrow, as we walk with Holy Spirit in our hearts, we know that we are children of God. Amen. And we live according to that reality. Now, we have a, a small uh, video that will show what is happening in our community in Keene.